why, but it's certainly interesting. Okay, so personal identity. Oh, oh, no, let me do this first. There's no synthetic a priori. What on earth happens here? Well, um, we end up with kind of a, that's not going to work. It's too close. But you have the a priori, and that has its own history, which is kind of intriguing because uh, um, it's a Latin expression that just means before. Right? So the a priori, prior to, right? uh, essentially. <clears throat> Um, with Aristotle, it essentially meant the premises in an argument, because those come first. And the a posteriori where we also get posterior from, right, uh, uh, comes after, right? So this, this would be the conclusion. This is the premises in an argument uh, that Aristotle could give, right? During the Middle Ages, it became a little bit more uh, sophisticated, and that eventually leads us then to, kind of, with Hume, the a priori is the experience that I have, uh, or, or the knowledge that I have, prior to my having an experience. And the a posteriori is the knowledge that I now have as a result of that experience. And if we add two other concepts, the analytic, analytic, right, and the synthetic, which is where we get, uh, uh, say here, when I, I talk about things that are essentially definitional, like all horses are animals, no horses are cows, and so on, right? Those are analytic statements, and so they're uh, what we would, we referred to when we looked at Aristotle's uh, logic as the A and the E statements are the analytic statements. And the synthetic statements are the specific things, like I and O statements. That horse is a gelding. You know, that pig is ready for slaughter. Uh -huh. you know, it's, it's whatever. You know, bacon, yeah. you know, says the dog. No, no, <laughs> says the dog. You know. And then I ate it. <laughs> You'd be mentally ill too, but the time this class is over, right? So, so you get these four things now, which give us gives us a grid, you know. So you can think of it, you know, like this. Uh, and um, a priori analytic information we have that's a horse, and all horses are animals. So I have analytic a priori information, and I also have a posteriori analytic information because that's how I find out this stuff. You know, so I, I. Little kid going up, that's a horse. Oh, it says nay. Yeah, you know, and you have all that stuff that you gradually accumulate that becomes what you think of as uh, uh, the definition then of. So the next time I see a horse, automatically I know all this stuff. So it's a priori analytic information, right? Now, that horse is a gelding. I just learned something about a particular animal. And now I know it, so that's a synthetic a posteriori type of knowledge, right? Okay. But what Hume says is that there is no synthetic a priori, which seems to be exactly right, because what would be synthetic is something that I just now experience, but I have to do it prior to having the experience. And that seems logically impossible to ever happen. There's no way that I can know that I'm going to turn around and the board is going to be black. This, no, no, it doesn't happen, right? It's all, all going to be close to your eye, uh, synthetic information. So all my synthetic information seems to happen as a result of my having that specific experience. I can't have the experience before having the experience. So I can't know it before I have the experience. It's just dumb. But now, Jung points out that all of metaphysics up until this point that we've studied in the course, Plato, Aristotle, all of the 
post-Aristotelians, all the medieval theologians, they were all trying to use the synthetic a priori to show how knowledge was possible. But the thing is, they couldn't actually do that. It's logically impossible. So basically all that they were doing was coming up with theory on no factual basis. As a result, I cannot go into a laboratory for metaphysical studies, take a couple of vials, and physically test to see whether Plato is right. Aha, yes, they're all ideas. <laughs> no, that doesn't, you can't check that. You know, I can't, I can't do Aristotle and check and see, aha, no, none of them are really ideas. They're actual physical things that I'm experiencing. No, I can't actually go to a laboratory and test to see whether Plato is right or Aristotle is right. They're both creating fictions that are interesting but cannot be demonstrated as true. It's not, you can't scientifically study them and not make uh, empirical observations that demonstrate that what they're saying is actually the case, right? As a result, all of that metaphysics that we studied up to this point was a total waste of your time. Okay. <laughs> now think about it. You know, we have this American cultural tradition that says philosophy, it's a waste of time because all you do is argue about uh, things that no one can ever solve, right? Well, if that's your attitude about philosophy, guess what? You got it from David Hume. <laughs> <laughs> <It's> <laughs> so you're philosophy. a follower of Hume if you think philosophy is a waste of time. Because uh, he's laughing at that too, and he's thinking, that's his great invention. You know, once I make this point, everyone's going to realize that was all bunkus. What are we studying all this stuff for? Uh, granted, there's still reasons to study it because historically you want to see what various uh, periods uh, essentially believed so you can understand their art, so you can understand their literature, etc. And it doesn't make much sense to try to understand uh, a particular uh, uh, literary uh, work unless you understand the philosophical point of view of the time. But the point that Hume is essentially making is we... we we aren't really learning the way things work by reading those philosophers because they're wrong. <laughs> or at least we have no way of testing to see if they're right or wrong. So philosophy, total waste of time. Up to this point. So you could actually just say, oh, I'm done. <laughs> or you can go on uh, because Kant might have an answer for you. And actually I'm sure that he does. I was challenging myself to think how far you could go back without having um, a prior experience. And I just thought of an analogy between the allegory of the cave and being in the womb, mm -hmm. where you would hear things, you would there, you'd be experiencing things, but you would have no prior uh, influence to where they would go in your brain or how you would feel about them. And then you would later be born and get to recategorize some things you might have heard or learned. I don't know, it's just where my mind was at right now. I wonder what your thoughts are on that about possibly being a ex knowledge before an experience, or at least having experienced something. Well, but even in the womb, you're actually having experiences. Mm -hmm. um, the air, the ear eventually gets to roughly around three months. It's actually recording. Uh, so the sound is already creating a neural pathway uh, through the mind. So I, I think it's absolutely intriguing to argue that, that um, by the time you're born, you're, you already have a <coughs> grammatical sense of how language is going to be structured for you. Well, for me, my thoughts is like how far in, uh, you know, in, in this reality, as we think of, can you go before you know, it gets di diluted? that you, you're just going off of, as we put, uh, posterior eye. Yeah, or, or... Like, is it already a lot, is it already based on something the moment we start conceiving images, and, you know, once we leave the womb and start seeing things, mm -hmm. is that when we start, is that reality, as we would put it, or... 
Mm. At that point, is it already yeah, posterior weird. knowledge? Yeah. Because they wouldn't well, have a right or wrong in the womb. They wouldn't know where to necessarily how to go about feeling a certain. Yeah, and well, I, I don't want to ruin the surprise of the ending of the course. But when we get to Quine, this whole arrangement is going to be destroyed. Jeez, it's going to get destroyed again. <laughs> Isn't it? You know, it's so frustrating. You know, you, you each step of the way you feel like, oh, we've just destroyed. You know, this it sounds you know, amazing. Point of view. We're going to take a hammer and but destroy now it. I've Oh, I've got it, yes. And then you turn the page and it's like, nope, no you haven't. <laughs> oh, that again. Boom. You know? Given a golden vase, only but, to smash but, it with a hammer. You know, if, if, if you look at... Um, let's kind of ruins the surprise. But the thing is, I think a lot of people by the end of the course end up to be uh, uh, kind of punch drunk. And, and not really paying attention to it. So they miss the significance of it. But if you look at two dogmas of empiricism, there's the one dogma. Turns out these dogmas are, are in for, I'll, I'll explain. Um, in our minds, in our minds, essentially what a pragmatist Quine points out is that um, I literally, what am I? I'm still filming. Yeah. That. Boy, that's.